so my name is samir shaheen hussain i'm a social justice activist a pediatrician um, an emergency physician who works in Montreal. I'm an assistant professor at the Faculty of Medicine at McGill University. Um, I've lived here all my life. My parents came here as immigrants from Pakistan in the 1970s. Um, it touched me personally in the sense that uh, we all have kids in our lives in some form or another. Um, and the basic question is, would this be the kind of care or the kind of situation that I would want a child that I care about to be living through um, and the answer if you ask that question is very obvious no. Evacuation et Remédical du Québec is a government institution um, that is responsible for medical evacuations in the province. And since they came into existence in the 1980s, they had basically prevented um, caregivers or parents from accompanying their kids during medevac uh, airlifts. Um, and that practice persisted uh, up until very recently um, for kids who required emergency uh, airlift um, on the Challenger plane. So systemic racism is basically the racism that exists in a system, in an institution, um, in the structures of society. There is racism embedded in the laws, in policies um, that, that allow racism to continue to exist. Then in the summer of 2017, I was working um, in the emergency department and there were two kids that were sent down from Nunavik alone um, uh, who needed emergency medical care. Um, and because they were alone, they were scared. It was very difficult to be able to get a good history to understand what was going on. It was just heartbreaking to see a kid, um, you know, regardless of their background, any child who's coming to, to the emergency department um, is going to be scared. Adults are scared to go to the emergency department. Um, and so a kid being alone hundreds of kilometers away from their family, um, not being able to speak the same language, um, and as healthcare providers we weren't able to speak, in this case, in Uktitut. Uh, it felt um, all the more jarring because then what I was seeing was I was seeing these kids on their stretchers alone, but what I was also seeing was I was also seeing this history that has played out over and over and over again of kids um, being forced, uh, you know, ripped away from their families um, and taken uh, from their families and sent down, in this case, for medical care. Um, and so just that intergenerational trauma was becoming much more obvious as well. Our role is supposed to care for these kids. Our, um, you know, primary motivation is do no harm. And yet here it felt like we were um, involved in basically perpetuating, inflicting trauma on these kids. So it was very emotionally um, jarring in that sense. Um, I couldn't ignore everything else that I know and that I've been a part of. Um, and in fact, it would actually have been um, a detriment if I would have done that because to ignore it would have um, uh, ignored a part of why this practice was allowed to continue for so long. What's interesting, I guess, uh, in retrospect with the Hand to Hold campaign is when you dig enough um, and you get to the root of why this practice persisted, when we get to the roots of that, the roots are medical colonialism, which itself is rooted in anti-Indigenous systemic racism. One of the reasons for writing the book was to use the, the campaign as kind of a case example that can be applied to all kinds of different situations um, of exposing the horrendous way governments, colonial governments, deal with indigenous health or more broadly different types of indigenous uh, self-determination issues, basically. Um, and one of the one of the elements was calling out medical colonialism, calling out anti-indigenous systemic racism. Um, in healthcare, so that hopefully things will, will change. We knew it was a rule, we knew it was awful, and yet we just kept going. The fact that healthcare providers are often complicit in injustices within healthcare, uh, one of the goals for the book is basically, you know, exposing this historical and contemporary examples um, of medical colonialism 
so that we can't just keep going, so that there's no excuse anymore. Um, we can't say that we didn't know, because now clearly it's all out there. Um, and these, these stories that many Indigenous communities have been talking about for years and years and years um, is all in one place, and we can see very, very clearly the role that the medical establishment has played in the genocidal colonial project. It's not one of complicity, it was an active role. I hope that those lessons of care, compassion, love can tie into the broader goals of dignity and justice for all.